Welcome back to 40 TV. I'm your host, 40. Today we're going over part six of my mastering series with Isotope's Ozone 5 plugin. I'm using the advanced version, but if you're using the regular one, don't worry, I'll try to point out the differences as we go, as I recall them. If you haven't seen parts one through five, check the video description. I should have links in there so you can see the whole series. Let's get started. I'm gonna go ahead and press spacebar on my keyboard to audition the track I have so far. Couple things you'll notice. Up here in this top window, this is a gain reduction trace. Those lines coming down from the top are the amount of gain reduction occurring um, at any given point within the waveforms of the track. You'll also notice down here at the bottom of the histogram, there is a little red number. That is showing you, based on the peak information of the audio coming into the plugin, what gain reduction is occurring. I'll go ahead and press spacebar again so you can see that. So you can see it bounces around from two to five, so averaging around four dBs of gain reduction. Again, we have a histogram happening here in the threshold um, area slash margin area. Um, we can change that by right clicking, going over to maximizer options and changing from histogram to gain reduction if you prefer to see that view. I'm gonna go ahead and cancel out of that and continue explaining uh, the interface of the maximizer. Next, below the gain reduction trace, we have a spectrum view. This shows your audio waveform. Don't really use this view too much, but it's there if you need it. And lastly, this is the dither shape, um, what is it called again? Dither shape plot. This will come into play when we talk about dithering and I'll explain that in a few. So over here on the left, we have the different limiting modes. Um, right now, IRC one, two, and three, these are, excuse me, proprietary limiting modes, uh, designed by Isotope. IRC3 is their latest implementation with Ozone 5. Um, each one provides a little bit of a different character, so depending on which one you'll, you use, um, it will sound slightly different. Uh, also, IRC3 uses much more CP CPU than IRC1, for example. Hard and soft limiting are not intelligent. In fact, IRC stands for Intelligent Release Control. So it's basically after the limiter is uh, doing its thing, how quickly does it release or snap back to then re-limit whatever signal is coming through. This is all intelligent in the first three modes. The next two modes, if we switch to them, just have a release control that is constant. So unintelligently, it's going to release based on whatever setting you have here both in hard and soft. Soft is the only one that is not a true brick wall limiter. If you set the soft mode, whatever your margin here, if you push it hard enough, it can break through your margin. Only IRC one through three and the hard mode are brick wall limiters, meaning whatever margin we set, it's not going to surpass that margin. However, <laughs> this inner sample detection, what this does is this enables true peaks for anal the analog domain. And what that means is when you bounce this digital material and it goes through another DA converter uh, and potentially is being let loose in the analog domain or is being re <laughs> released into the analog domain, having this on is gonna prevent any possible clipping beyond your margin in the analog domain. No matter what we set here in the digital domain, it is possible that the analog domain adds up to three possible dBs of uh, gain. So by turning this on, this is happening um, in the intelligently. It only works in certain modes, so it doesn't uh, work in soft or hard. It only works in the intelligent modes. If you turn this on, you also notice up here, my CPU is taking a hit. Depending on what we turn on within this plugin, it takes a hit. If I switch over to IRC1, we drop down to 31% CPU usage in Ableton Live. Obviously, if you're using uh, Pro Tools, Cubase, etc., cetera, um, you may see different CPU usage and latency and so forth. We switch back over to IRC3, it increases the CPU usage, and inner sample uh, detection, by turning this on, this may change the sound of your audio slightly, so here with it, with and without, but when possible, and it's not uh, making any changes that you dislike, go ahead and leave this on, as long as you are you can take it within the CPU range. Um, and you're not killing or taxing yourself too hard here. Next, you have a, okay, so the threshold and the margin settings. The threshold setting, as we drag this threshold down, it's going to introduce uh, 
limiting based on where this slider is. It's also going to increase the perceived loudness of the track. The lower we bring the slider down, the louder it's going to get, but it's also going to increase, uh, introduce artifacts into our track. Um, so you do not want to drag this threshold down too far. Based on the gain reduction that's happening, you may be looking for 3 to 6 dB of gain reduction. I'm going to move this slider around so you can hear the differences of extremely aggressive by lowering the threshold even more and even less aggressive by just a little bit. So up here at minus 1.5, very unaggressive, not seeing very much gain reduction. In fact, it's not increasing the perceived loudness very much. And let me turn it up. Now you'd, you'd never probably set it to minus 14, but at minus 14 we saw in the trace that we're seeing a lot of gain reduction. You're probably hearing lots of artifacts. It doesn't sound good. And it turns out when I was just quickly setting this at minus 5.5, this is actually a good setting for this track. Um, but again, based on the gain reduction, based on what your ears hear is what you're going to set this threshold uh, level to. You keep turning this down, you're also losing some of the dynamics in your track. That's And dynamics are the difference between your loudest and softest points in your music. Losing that dynamics, it loses some of its character, it doesn't sound as beautiful as it can sound, etc. The character is basically... Character is mentioning between IRC 1 through 3, the intelligent modes. It's release time for hard and soft, but the character basically is um, how hard, it, it's the same thing, it's the release, but how hard, how smooth. As we uh, modify this slider based on the different modes from IRC 1 through 3, it will change the sound as well. If we're looking for an aggressive sounding limiter and we really want to make the sound crispy, turn it down the clipping. If you want something that sounds extremely, in fact, it, it almost transparent um, and not as aggressive, you can bring it up to very slow. The default setting of four is actually pretty good, but I'm gonna adjust this so you can hear the differences. So at four, it sounds like so. can see as we dropped it to zero it just got a little bit crisper but you should hear the huge difference when we take it from zero all the way up to the top to slow now to further illustrate this if we drag this threshold down you'll see a little bit more what's going on so I'm gonna drag this down to exaggerate not because we would be doing this for our final track but just to show you what's happening with the character so as I drag this down the lines end up becoming more crisp when you have it set down to zero because it's quickly snapping back to its uh, previous state before it was limiting, um, before new audio signal comes in, as opposed to when it's up here, it takes its sweet time, if you will, right? So again, for this particular situation, we're going to leave it at 4, minus 5.5. If you have the advanced version of the plugin, then you have transient recovery. And what transient recovery is basically giving us the illusion of our transient peaks, even though they're being squashed by the limiter. But by turning this on, we're going to take a CPU hit by a few percent, something to point out. And where you set this, it's entirely up to you. I had set it at 20, but anywhere from 20 to 60, maybe even up to 80, somewhere around there for this particular track works. Um, it's going to give us that perceived um, snap of our kicks. Those initial attacks that are being crunched by the limiter are going to be perceptibly still there by turning this option on. Again, you're taking a CPU hit, so if you can do it, do it. And again, listen to it with and without. So this is with, and we'll set it, I don't know, let's set it to 60. And then that was without. So I think, hey, with at a setting of 60 sounds all right. Next, Stereo Link. Depending on the mode that you're in will determine whether you can use Stereo Link as well as transi Transient Recovery, by the way. Hard and Soft don't allow you to use these options. Um, what Stereo Link does, 
is by default stereo link is actually on and set to 100%. If we turn it on and we don't change it, it's the same as it being off. But if we turn this on and we drag the slider down to less than 100%, what you're doing is you're allowing the limiter to work independently on the left channel and the right channel. So right now, the limiter is working on the stereo sum of the left and right channels. So it's limiting the sounds that come in from the left and the right at the, so whatever triggers it basically. If something that's loud that's happening on the left channel comes in and triggers it, okay, it's, it's going to affect both in the left and the right channels. If we drag this slider down, especially below 50%, because 50% and above still works more at the sum of the two left and right channels. 50% and below um, then works more independently. Now in a track like this where we do not have so much excitement going on in the left channel or the right channel, um, leaving the stereo link off or even setting it, turning it on and setting it somewhere 70 to 80, okay, that's gonna be fine. But uh, truthfully, in an electronic track like this, I'd probably leave it off. If we had a huge stereo, um, we had a huge stereo width on our track and different sounds were occurring in our left and right channels that we wanted to be limited and compressed independently, then dragging the slider down and playing with it can produce some interesting effects and may sound right for that material. It's possible to introduce some phasing issues, but the Ozone 5 deals with them incredibly well, and in most cases, you'll be okay dragging this slider down here. It's important to note, I'm gonna leave it off, but um, go ahead and play with it. So now that we've talked about the maximizer, let's go ahead and talk about dither. Right now we're working in a 24-bit session. And in that 24-bit session, if we're trying to output to CD or we're trying to output to um, a 16-bit session for another type of release, um, what we want is, is to dither. Now obviously our DAW, in this particular situation I'm using live, but if you're using Pro Tools, etc., etc., those DAWs can dither for you. However, the dithering that's happening here within the plugin um, is a little bit more intelligent. So if we turn our dithering type, there's three different modes. There's Mbit, there's Type 1, and Type 2. I'm gonna talk about Mbit. This is the proprietary version of Iso or uh, dithering type from Isotope, and it sounds extremely good. Um, both 1 and 2 use different types of um, distribution functions. Type 1 uses a rectangular and type 2 uses triangular. It's extremely scientific and it goes way over my head so I'm going to stick with M but plus um, and let's talk about it. So in order for you to see what's happening with dither I'm going to go ahead and turn the gain sliders down both for the input and the output. Now when I press play you should hear within your speakers or headphones, an extremely crunchy, distorted sound. That's because I have it set at 8-bit, and the reason I'm doing that is to illustrate what dither is all about. So at no dither amount and no noise shaping, at 8-bit we hear crunchiness, right? I'm gonna turn it up just a little bit. As I increase the dither amount from none to low, let's listen, and I'm going to keep uh, changing the dither amount so you can hear the differences between. Actually, let me say real quick, at low, you notice it's introduced noise because that's what dither is. It's an introduction of noise as you're removing bits because you're removing pieces of the audio and in order for it to still sound sonically, um, still sound like the song that we want it to sound like, it's an introduction of noise. So as we introduce more noise here, it's actually gonna sound more pleasing, but at these little levels, you're gonna hear the noise extremely well. Notice, let me set it back to none. Uh, notice that when it was at high, you didn't hear crunch anymore, right? So that's what dithering uh, amount is. Now when we click up here in noise shaping, we can click on this view, and as we change our noise shape, this is going to shape the noise that's coming in, that it's in, uh, injecting into our track to allow it to sound less, uh, crunchy if you will because it's dropping whatever bit depth you were at 
to whatever bit depth you're setting. Um, I'm going to go ahead and turn this back on to uh, high and then I'm going to change the noise shape as it's playing and you'll hear the different ones. It goes from lightest to ultra and the higher you go the more CPU usage but let's hear how it sounds. So notice that once we got up to high and ultra, it actually sounded, basically what it's doing is it's pushing those noises into areas of the sonic spectrum that are least noticeable to us. So it's still going to inject the noise to make the soundtrack sound proper, but it's making it so it's kind of out of our area of interest, if you will. Auto blanking, what that means is if there's no audio signal going into the plugin, uh, or there's 0.7 seconds of silence, it's going to turn off the injection of noise or dither. Um, so you can go ahead and turn that on in most situations. As far as limit peaks and harmonic suppression, I don't typically use them. Um, and harmonic suppression is only uh, available on certain settings within your dither type. And what it's going to do is, it's scientific, you're going to have to look that up in the help file, it's hard for me to explain it. Um, Next, this DC offset filter, you're going to want to turn this on. Um, and again, this is something that I'm not sure how to explain, but I, would, I, I know that you want to have the DC filter on. So again, we're going to have this set to 16-bit. We're currently working in a 24-bit session. I'm going to press Option, click on my input. I remember this is, was at minus 1.1 dB because we gave us a, ourselves a little headroom. I'm going to press Option and click on our output, set it back to zero. I'm going to set my dither type, input plus, and I'm set the noise shaping to high. I'll set the dither amount to normal. And this is the dither settings I'll be using for this track. What's important to note, once we apply dither, you do not want to apply dither at any other phase. So if I'm planning to output this at a 24-bit master that I'm going to dither at some other point, maybe before I create an MP3 with some other type of audio program, etc., etc., you do not want to inject noise or dither more than once. So make sure that this is the last step. If I leave, if I set this to 16-bit and I bounce this track right now, I go up to file export audio and in my export audio um, dialog box if I don't set my bit depth to 16 here it's not going to change the fact that this is a 24-bit uh, file even though I've dithered it down to 16-bit it will be a 16-bit audio file inside of a 24-bit container if that makes sense so remember that even though you're dithering down to 16-bit here you need to set your output options to 16-bit as well if that's what you're going for. If you want to have this in the highest quality possible and you don't want to set any dithering so you have a master for future, you can leave this at 24-bit. Also, if you're working in 24-bit and this track is being output to be played on uh, DVD or Blu-ray and it's going uh, for film or something to that effect, remember they work in 24-bit. So you're, if you're working in 24-bit, you do not need to set any dither because you're working in the same uh, bit depth that you're going to output to. But if you're working in 24-bit or now with 64-bit audio workstations that have plugins that are sending 32-bit uh, floating point data between each other, then you're going to want to dither down. And again, depending on what your output delivery is for, whether it's CD, whether it's internet audio, whether it's DVD, etc., will determine whether you're going to turn on dithering or whether you're not. So if we're going out to CD and I want to make my CD version of this track, I have these settings here. You're not going to hear this because remember, dither is injecting noise at the lowest points. So at the full volume, you know, nothing. So we'll go ahead and press spacebar. You'll also see visually right here, you're seeing that we have 16 bits blinking within here. The bottom one is the least significant bit and this second row is the most significant bit. Uh, bit. I'm not sure why this top row is here because this top row here is just for visual purposes because there's 24 rows, but it actually never lights up. 
So, in totality, guys, I hope you like this tutorial, and I hope you like this whole series of Isotopes Ozone 5. I know it was a long time in coming, but I finally took the time to bang it all out in, with, in under two weeks. A lot of good information. Remember that when you're working on your tracks, whether you're working with the settings that I gave you here within these tutorials, or you're working with presets, these are starting points. You need to listen with your ears through proper monitors when mastering. Don't master on cheap headphones or cheap computer desktop speakers. And whenever you set these master settings for your track and you bounce your track, let's say to CD. So at this point, I would go up to File, Export Audio. I bring up this dialog box. I'm going to set it to 16. Remember, our sample rate for CDs are 44.1 and I bounce this track. When I bounce this track and I go, I'm gonna play this on different sources. Because remember, if you have nice speakers, whatever you're using inside your mastering studio or your home studio, you're gonna wanna hear this on many different sources because people are not using the same speakers as yours. You're using really high quality speakers so you can hear what it sounds like in the best of situations, but you need to hear what it sounds like in the worst of situations. Play it on a laptop that has really crappy speakers. Play it on a desktop with crappy speakers. Play it in your car if you have a nice sound system. Play it in a club. That will give you an idea how your mastering environment is. If you notice that it really sounds good at your house, but when you put it in your car, it's lacking low end, then you know you need to probably make some changes within either your mixing or your mastering session. Also, if you notice that it really sounds horrible at really low volumes, these are other things that you need to look at, right? So again, hope this was a lot of help, guys. Please, if you like my content, like and subscribe to my YouTube channel. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments. Until next time, I'm out.